Welcome to another edition of Paratalk. I'm Gareth Davis in Los Angeles, California. Once again, I'm joined by paranormal enthusiast, Mr. Reeves Cook in the UK. This week, we have a very special edition of Paratalk. This week, we're going to get all Highgate on you. Now, some of you out there might know exactly what I mean, while the rest of you are left scratching your heads thinking, hi, what? This week, we're joined by Della Farrant. Della is the author of a forthcoming history of Highgate. She's publishing a book and a website called Haunted Highgate. Della has been researching the paranormal for many, many years And uh, the website, which is live on Halloween 2013, so depending on when you're listening to this show, um, it should be ready to go. Um, She encourages locals and visitors to Highgate to share their stories of the supernatural and explores the darker side of Highgate's history. She's the archivist, archivist of the British Psychic and Occult Society and is married to David Farrant of the Highgate Vampire Infamy. Although, like David, she's one of the first to point out that there's more to Highgate than hammer horror vampires. Della lives in Muswell Hill in North London. Hello, Della. Hello, Gareth. Well, we should say hi to Reeves, too. Hello, Reeves. And Reeves. Sorry for my... Hello. Uh, uh, Yeah, I'm just on the chair in the corner this week. (laughs) Hello. Hello, Della. Hello, very pleased to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. So, Del, I mean, you have this great website coming out this week, ready for Halloween, a uh, haunted Highgate, and both Reeves and I have has had have had a, a kind of glimpse into where you're going with this. Plus, you have a, a book that's going to be coming out early next year called Haunted Highgate, which looks very, very interesting. Now, um, you live in Highgate. Well, I guess Muswell Hill, which is close to... How, what's the relationship between Muswell Hill and Highgate? Muswell Hill is... Well, where I actually live is opposite Highgate Woods. Uh, Muswell Hill is situated just north of Highgate, so it's about a 15-minute walk to get down to the village from here. Uh, and the quickest way to do that is through Highgate Woods. There's... I won't leap too quickly into the ley line, but there's a ley line that runs from Highgate Cemetery up through Highgate Woods. So there's that kind of uh, metaphysical connection to Highgate as well as geographically. Um, now, the Highgate Cemetery is like this, I guess, it's a fairly big cemetery. It, it's, uh, it's cut in half by Swain's Lane. And um, when I visited Highgate in 2000, I, I was taken aback how one side of the cemetery seems to be all neat and prim and proper, and the other side is very dark and foreboding. Yes, the architecture of the tombs in the two cemeteries is very different. And, and I think one, the main reason why Highgate Cemetery West has such a distinctive feel to it, it it's on a, they're both on a hill, but a very steep hill. But Highgate Cemetery West is built on the foundations, the, the old Victorian layout or pre-Victorian layout of Ashurst House um, grounds. Uh, that house was demolished to make way for... St. Michael's Church and for the building of the cemetery. So you're actually walking around on some very old um, layouts. The Circle of Lebanon, for example, in the middle of the, well, the top of the cemetery is surmounted by that, I don't know if you remember, by that, that very big tree, the Cedar of Lebanon, which was part of the original garden plan. So... Uh, it, it is. And, it's, it's it's breathtakingly. I mean, it's beautiful. The architecture is amazing. It's very gothic. Um, it seems very old, um, and uh, you can understand why it would have this kind of. Uh, um, I mean, it is the archetypal cemetery. I mean, I mean, all cemeteries that are used in movies and, and attractions, are, I guess, in many ways, are based on that kind of architecture. Yes, and the Friends of Highgate Cemetery maintain uh, both cemeteries, uh, which are working cemeteries. And the Friends adopted this policy in 1975 of uh, managed neglect. So it, while they, they try to keep it as safe as possible from falling masonry and um, paths where you could just slip down into the ground, which nobody wants to do in a haunted cemetery, do they? Right. Um, they try and keep it safe, and it is, it is much tidier than it was in the 70s. It's, it's beautiful. Um, 
Manic. They work very carefully to keep that balance between that, that you know, that, that gothic rambling feel, the overgrown feel, and a, a working symmetry that is tidy and clean. That's a wonderful term, managed neglect. I've never heard that before. That's very cool. <laughs> Lots of things in Highgate are contentious. That's a contentious term. Some people have been quite mean about it and said, well, that's just a way of saying uh, letting it go wild, which is not what they do at all. It's, it's, it's heavily conserved. They've got in-house conservationists and, and so on. So what was the, uh, the main uh, thrust of you deciding to, uh, to put together the website and ultimately uh, the book Haunted Highgate? It was actually born of personal frustration. I'm very interested in debating the paranormal. If you try and debate the paranormal with regard to Highgate on the internet, you quickly find yourself immersed in flame wars. That It seems to attract people that aren't particularly interested in the paranormal, although they profess to be. They're more interested in infighting and backstabbing and Oh, debating whether or not it's a ghost or a vampire, and that's where the discussion stops. They don't then go on to discuss what sort of ghost, inverted commas, it could be. Um, so I wanted to write a book talking about people's real experiences, cutting out all the nastiness, and encouraging some, uh, w- on the website front, encouraging some adult serious debate in a friendly, safe environment about Highgate. And there is... Mm, there's about one or two places you can do that at the moment. So I saw a need for that. Well, both Reeves and I have had a, a, a kind of behind-the-scenes look at the site, and it's it's a beautifully well well put together site. Some great content, and I think uh, both Reeves and I are, are, are eager to see where it goes and what uh, what uh, facets and articles and stories are added to it. Um, even though Highgate Cemetery is, I, I would guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the primary focus, there's a lot more going on in that general area outside of the cemetery. I Actually, I would say that Swain's Lane is probably the, the, the main focus of the activity. Uh, although there's obviously, there's an overlap because um, the, the top of Swain's Lane, the top gate is one area that seems to... There seem to be a lot of sightings of this archetypal tall, dark figure. Hackneyed phrase, but how else do you describe it? Um, and then you've, this is where the ley line seems to come in. You've, you've got this north to south ley line. And this is another reason why I'd like to open debate on the website about the nature of this figure there's a lot of sightings in the local pubs and even in i've got some private houses where this almost identical figure has been seen but therein lies the rub is it the same figure moving about along this ley line well that's that's kind of fascinating that uh, i mean uh, we've all heard the stories of the tall dark figure with the red eyes you know waiting at the gate and um i i remember as a child here uh hearing somebody saying that it was in the newspaper that uh, it had like dissolved in front of the the headlights of a car uh and and, you know as a small child hearing that that kind of um i mean whether or not that actually happened i don't know but i remember that that story kind of burned into my head i believe that did happen yes um my husband david farrant has researched this case for decades and it was he wrote a letter to the hammond high in i think january 1970 Oh, February 1970. And this prompted a lot of people coming forward with their their accounts of being assaulted in Swain's Lane by this entity and yeah. vanishing in front of the headlights, as you say. Yeah, and that was a, such a striking uh, um, kind of mental image. Um, you know, as, as a small child, that kind of planted the seeds in my head, at least, to be interested in, in uh, the, the Highgate uh, phenomena and or vampire. Um, let me bring Reeves in here, because Reeves has been sitting patiently <laughs> on, on, his, <laughs> on his stool in the corner of the studio, <laughs> waiting patiently. So, Reeves, anything you want to jump in here and, and ask about? I have a million questions to ask, but there's, there's actually, Della picked up on a very interesting point, and one of the most, um, I think, for me, if I were in that position, one of the most spooky or, or unnerving And that is to do with an individual. I think this happened some time ago. He was in the older part of Highgate where this this energy, this this thing had been seen. 
and he was taking, um, I think he was an accountant, he was taking a short home, and it was uh, later in the evening, and he encountered uh, this this mass, um, and his when he was questioned, he said that it was as if it was um, hypnotizing him to, to, you know, to, to sort of freeze him on the spot. And it's, it was only a few seconds and it vanished. So th- there's definitely something strange going on in that, in that area, Swain's Lane. And I'm, I'm sure Della has got plenty of uh, information regarding uh, people that have seen, or even to the point where we have the, uh, is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Della, that the phantom cyclist that cycles at you at speed to sort of, you know, scare you and then it vanishes. <laughs> the phantom cyclist is not yeah. going in haunted high gates simply no. because it, he never existed <laughs> oh, he's, he's entered the canon of high gates uh, ghosts but he never well he does exist he's still alive but he's very much human and it was very much a real bike oh, tell, tell us a little bit about it then so this was a, 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 i guess a, a misidentification it sounds like a deliberate misidentification this is part of what makes the uh, a, the job very difficult for anybody trying to unpick the nine, late 1960s, early 70s era of uh, Highgate's paranormal history. Highgate has a very strong pub culture, and it's a small community, and people, well, I don't know so much now, but in those days, I suppose there wasn't any television, <laughs> not much, and people used to make their own entertainment, play a lot of um, jokes on each other and so on, and When David wrote his letter to the paper, a lot of people who knew him decided to try and sabotage, in my opinion, what was a serious endeavour and wrote in silly... Well, that was a silly letter regarding the cyclist. It was an in-joke about somebody uh, David knew, was acquainted with, and it should never have been taken seriously. It was it was just a gag. So it was a real a real person then, a real person that uh, that uh, uh, was the the cyclist, and it just kind of morphed into this phantom deal. He yeah. See, I think he used to get teased about his bicycle because I mean, in fact, he purchased that bicycle from David Farrant himself and uh, <laughs> painted it. I think it was pink. Hence, he seemed to acquire the nickname the Pink Panther. He also ah. had the nickname Eggman. Um, <laughs> it was just silliness, but it just shows you how these um, stories can get picked up and then people repeat and repeat and repeat. Right. And before you know it, it's in books. Yeah. And, it never and also how we can have an account of, of something like that and the power of the internet can give it its own kind of its own momentum. And then people start to debate stuff that it hasn't really isn't based on anything really, and I think That's that there's right. a lot of there's a lot of accounts um, as as you just you know as you just uh, made clear that it's very difficult when researching stuff you have to sort of look at it from uh, maybe different angles and ha- uh, and have your own approach to it because unfortunately if you just follow the 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 normal route it's so easy to become kind of uh, confused with what is true, what really happened, and what didn't happen. And then you get your cynics who would respond to what I just said about the phantom cyclist in the late 60s, early 70s, and people having a laugh and say, well, if you're, if you're saying that's a laugh, how do we know the rest of it wasn't a laugh? How do we know the whole thing wasn't one big hoax? Right. Yeah, this is why it's, um, uh, as Gareth and I will agree, this is why people who experience any form of uh, apparition, uh, you know, any sort of paranormal phenomenon, uh, where there's a group of people who all see the same thing. Um, I th- I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, the London Paranormal Group who witnessed something very strange in uh, Highgate Cemetery on a, uh, it was a walkthrough? I think it was a walkthrough. Yes, Are you familiar with yes. that? Yes. And they that saw was, an um... apparition of a, per- of, a, of a man, I think it was, wasn't it? That, yes, that was in June last year. That was Mickey Go Call of North London Paranormal Investigations. And they were shown around a new medium who just joined their group called Gemma. And so they were just walking around. They didn't just go to Highgate. I think they, they were driving around. They, they stopped and parked the car. They were showing her some of the sites of Highgate. I think she's from Essex, so they were familiarising her with the area. And uh, they actually, Louise, Mickey's wife, was with them as well. However, she was looking the wrong way at the time, and she didn't see it, which is interesting. And then again, you know, people, yeah. people might say, well, that account that Mickey gave is very detailed. 
as some cynics would say, well, the more detail you've got, the less chance there is of it actually having happened. Mm. But if you're going to, again, if you're going to hoax something like that, well, surely you'd rope the wife in if she's there too, or you've got three <laughs> witnesses. <laughs> but well, no, well, she didn't see well, in it. My, um, yeah, in my, uh, my number of years studying the phenomenon, I, uh, it's, there are a lot of people out there that have still got this kind of um, mindset that when you see an apparition, it's it's going to be, uh, you know, floating around or transparent. But there are a lot of people out there that witness this strange phenomenon of apparitions and say that when they see uh, the apparition, it's just like they're looking at a normal person, solid, just an everyday person. The only difference is it either walks through a wall or one minute it's there and the next minute it's gone. I, I would I would agree with that because I, that's uh, yeah. the, one of the, the the paranormal experiences I had is is, is along those lines. Um, I want to ask Della though about because we've mentioned the, that paranormal group now a few years ago something that made headlines the world over it, it made it even made the the news over here in L A was uh, aging pop star George Michael in his haunted house, which I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, overlooks Highgate Cemetery. Could you tell us a little bit about that case? I don't know too much about that one, to be honest. I think that's one that kind of got out of hand. It got picked up by the media. And from what I understand, and I apologize to Mickey if I've got this wrong, Mickey and his team were out and about, um, again, looking around Highgate and I suppose, in a way, that they were they were expecting to attract attention because of the way they were dressed, you know, wearing their hoodies with the logo of their group on and so on, and encouraging people to come up and talk to them and share their experiences if they have any of the area being haunted. And somehow they collided with George Michael, and then it all got blown out of proportion. And and, and then the, I think it was the Sun or one of those big tabloids ran, a, ran, a, ran an article saying, uh, "Oh, George Michael's house is haunted by a vampire." House probably isn't haunted, and there never never was a vampire, you know. Yeah, he's, and he's, he still lives there, though, right? It's not like he moved out in terror or anything. No, he's always bombing around <laughs> Muswell Hill and Highgate in his car, crashing into things. Oh, well, it's a bit cruel to call him aging as well. Well, he's, he can't be that old, can he, George uh, Michael? I don't know. He's got to be. 50s, 60s, 50s, 60s, I would, I would guess. No, I mean, I, I mid, know, mid 50s, I'd say. David's uh, raising an eyebrow at me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so George Michael, now, th- there's, there's, there's some amazing properties in Highgate. Now, I remember this. When I, when I visited uh, Highgate um, and I went on the infamous tour, um, I, I was struck by, you know, all the Gothic architecture and then looking up and seeing this enormous glass, futuristic, high-tech house overlooking the cemetery. Now, that is very interesting. That house is known as the Corten House. It was built by the architect John Winter. And he built it, I believe he built it for his family, um, um, his young family at the time, to live in. And that work on that house began in, I think it was 68. It was certainly um, going on or nearing completion around about 69, in 69. And this is when there's this, you see this huge um, surge of reports of this figure in Swains Lane. And it seems to be a point that's been missed somewhat. Well, you, you, um, you hear a, a lot in a lot of hauntings, and I know that Reeves and I have discussed this on many occasions mm-hmm. on Paratalk, is that um, a house can be perfectly fine with no phenomena whatsoever, but the minute they say, okay, well, if we knock down this wall and we had an extension here and we change this, then suddenly it's haunted. Yep. So do you think that maybe, just maybe, that uh, the construction of this kind of futuristic home right uh, basically on the cemetery disturbed something i think it's quite possible what it disturbed i think needs to be taken out of the realms of scooby-doo i mean it's a cemetery no well people have died in that cemetery there's been quite a few suicides there but when we all know when you're looking at a haunting that's active you tend to be looking at 
uh, the cause is likely to be connected to what happened when people were alive and time that they spent there and so on, unless you're talking about something that never was alive and we're getting into shadow people or other, other ways of categorizing an entity. But the fact that it's in a cemetery does not necessarily make it likely to disturb anything. That's where it gets really curious. What exactly uh, is it disturbing? Yeah, I just want to jump in and, and, and with the whole cemetery. Um, it's, I always look, what was there before? What, what was there before? What, this yes. energy, what, whatever it might be, you know, it, it might even not be connected to, directly to the cemetery itself. It might be connected to that area. We're talking ley lines. We're talking lines of mm -hmm. energy. Uh, we're talking uh, sort of when you uh, make a new building, you create something, you're changing the environment. So you're changing that kind of environmental energy. Maybe it st stirred something up. We get it a lot with, I mean, there's the Gatehouse pub uh, in Highgate. Um, there's also the, the Flask Tavern. They're all very old buildings. They're all in that kind of Highgate vicinity. And They've all got phenomenon going on in them. And we get it a lot with older houses which are converted to hotels or guest houses, pubs uh, with, or taverns that go back to the 15th or the 13th or the 16th century where uh, they do these modernizations. They bring it all up to date. And yet, and then all of a sudden, as, as Gareth mentioned just a moment ago, you, get, you start to get this flux of a paranormal phenomenon that seems to sort of come from nowhere. Uh, the, you know, I think it was, um, I can't which remember which, uh, I think it was the, uh, the Flask Tavern that the uh, landlord was so traumatized by what he had experienced uh, from seeing an apparition that he was advised to give up his job. It was that, it messed him up that bad. So there's yes, definitely that something happen. there. He was hospitalized, yes. So t tell yeah. us about that, Della, because I, I remember at, at my visit, I remember driving past the flask looking for... It was actually the gatehouse. It's the gatehouse where okay. that occurred. Yeah. So w w what's the story there? What happened there exactly? There's a landlord and his wife um, take over the property. They, they move in with uh, a cellarman come barman. And the wife's not happy at all, doesn't enjoy it. The daughter comes to stay. She's... She hates it there. They feel like they're being watched all the time. They're hearing footsteps. Very unpleasant atmosphere at night. And after, I think they'd only been there a matter of maybe two months. Um, it wasn't long, in any case. The landlord is upstairs in the uh, kind of... It's like a gallery up there. It's now a theatre, but it was um, used for bands and so on in, in the late 60s to perform. He's up there turning the lights off and suddenly sees this apparition. Um, very dis dis I think he said it was floating, sort of shrouded or wearing a smock, very ill-defined face, apart from the fact that it was exuding negativity and, and acting very menacing. And it spoke to him. He said, wait, I think wait, wait, he wait. said, go away or what do you want or something. So it, it's the... Uh he saw the figure. Was, was it? Was there? Did it look like a person, or just the voice yeah. came out of nowhere? Or how? How did that work? It looked like a person, but it wasn't right. He was. He knew it wasn't human. He didn't. It, right. There's nothing in the documentation to suggest that he thought it was a punter who'd not left. <laughs> right. He got up. You know, at, at chucking out time. Yeah, yeah. He, he knew it was something supernatural from the moment he saw it. And, and what exactly did it say to him? You're taking him with you. You're Cryptic, isn't it? That's very... You're taking him with you. He saw it a second night, and he, he subsequently developed a, a heart problem. Um, he became very ill and was rushed to hospital. Whilst he was in hospital, the barman, uh, who I mentioned earlier, saw the same apparition, and we don't know if he was pushed or he fell. I don't think he's clear either. Down the stairs... Unclear if he was hospitalized as well, but he was certainly hurt. And immediately, the whole, um, you know, the, 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 all three of them moved. They, they gave up and they left. And then the brewery had to recruit a new manager. And they actually put a caveat in there saying, uh, advance warning, this pub is haunted. Wow. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> 
you're taking him with you. Did, as, and over the years, has, has any meaning been, been placed upon those words? Well, I think it's not that profound. I think it, it probably referred to the barman. Well, yeah, like he was going to hospital and uh, a few days later the other guy was going to follow him. Yeah, like you're all getting out and I'm going to make sure you get out and you're taking him with you. Wow. Like maybe it indicated a particular personal dislike for the barman. I don't know. That's, that's a great story. All right. Now, I, say that, I say that's not profound, but it is in a way profound because yeah, it, it is implies in a way, yeah. consciousness. Absolutely, yeah. Let's, um, before we get into some of the main uh, thrust of, of the, the, the specters and hauntings in Highgate, let's take a real quick break. We'll be right back. The Mind Tech Podcast is your weekly dose of tech, privacy, security, and conspiracy. Each week, the Mind Tech Podcast will talk about the very latest tech news and the continued threats to internet freedom. Hosted by Garrett Davis and Joe Resington. You can download and subscribe to the Mind Tech Podcast at mindsetcentral.com. You're listening to Paratalk. Hi, everyone. This is Gareth from uh, MindsetCentral.com. Uh, just coming on really quickly to talk to you about subscribing or donating to Mindset Central. Um, right now, we average about 17 brand new podcasts a month on Mindset Central, and that's for free. So you get that content for free. It always has been free. And it will continue to be free. But uh, just take a moment to imagine the time and the effort it takes to put all that together. Plus also creating, building, sustaining the website and the server costs. Um, we're constantly finding ourselves reaching the point that, uh, that sometimes is the breaking point. And uh, we're, we're up against that old foe of time and money. And we're hoping that with your help, we can break through this wall. Not only do we want to continue with Mindset Central, but we want to build upon it and create something very special on the Internet. So please think about helping us and becoming a subscriber. By becoming a subscriber to Mindset Central, you'll have access to the subscriber section, which provides exclusive, all-new podcasts and a lot more. The subscriber section has and will continue to grow into an area that you will want to be a part of. And with monthly access priced at that of a, a large coffee at Starbucks. So for one coffee, you get access to the subscriber section. Packed with content, content that is continually added to on a weekly basis. So please help us. Help us by becoming a subscriber. Thank you. And we're back. Okay, so before we left the air, we were just going to get into the infamous figure of Swain's Lane. Now, we mentioned at the beginning of the show that Swain's Lane is the kind of roadway that divides the cemetery, divides Highgate Cemetery into two parts. Um, and I guess, uh, Della, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, a heavy pub culture in Highgate. Now, I don't know if, if that's still the case, but I guess in the late 60s, early 70s, people would, you know, they, they hang out at the pub, have a few beers with their pals, and then walk home via Swain's Lane, a kind of shortcut, or, you know, then maybe that's where they live, and go down through the center of the cemetery divided by this, this road. And occasionally strange things would happen that's right yes um but i don't think it's it's right to connect it so much with the pubs 
most of the encounters which we have on file from the 1960s and 70s are yeah. of people that are using the lane to get to and from Highgate to get to work or to get to college. Gotcha. Uh, they're professional people. They're sober. And nurses and students and so on. Serious students. Yeah, you're, Not thrill-seeking students, just people getting from A to B. No, you're right. The, the, the reason I... I, I mean, I, I didn't think. I'm thinking, you know, because the, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, you know, you get kicked out of the pub at 11.30 or midnight, it's the middle of the night, and you're walking down Swain's Lane. It, it was yes, it was it was more of the time period rather than <laughs> you know getting, <laughs> getting all good and liquored up. But you know what I mean. The entity doesn't seem that fussy about what time of day it appears. It rather seems that night makes nighttime could make it easier to manifest. If we're thinking down the shadow person route, that so you, you rarely see them during the day, although it has been noted. So what? So what are the, some of the? What, what's the earliest report of this figure? Do, do, do you know when it first started to uh, make appearances, or, or people would begin to see it and, and start talking about it? I've got Victorian reports of which they're very difficult to analyse, but they give the impression that the people in Highgate are considered to be very superstitious, silly people. Um, prone to fears of dark figures rampaging around the village at night, haven't got the actual um, written reports from the people that are being made fun of for believing in this, but you've got satire about this. The earliest witness report we have on file is, I think, from 62, uh, which was from a cemetery worker who regularly, well, on two occasions, not regularly, saw a shrouded figure in the cemetery once appearing over a wall or sort of levitating above a wall like it was peering over the wall at him and once standing near the top gate, the classic sighting spot. Then in 65, there's another detailed witness account of somebody seeing it in Swain's Lane itself. Then you have a glut of them in the early 70s, again in Swain's Lane. The one you mentioned, the architect Thornton in the cemetery itself. And in the local pubs. And a lot of those are documented. You know, there's names and ages and addresses and so on. Um, now the, those people weren't rolling drunk after the pub, you know. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have brought that up. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, that's fine. It's, it's fair enough. There were 19 pubs in Highgate in Victorian times oh, or wow. in the 18, early 18th century. Man. Um, now, the, the, the amazing thing is, though, is that there was, you know, the, the whole vampire hysteria from the late 60s, early 70s, where, you know, there's that famous BBC report where there's, you know, a million people there doing all kinds of nonsense. Um, and this entity or, or whatever it is, people still see it today. It's not something that's purely cultural. It's not something that because of the hysteria, people saw things and then the hysteria went away and, and so did the, the sightings. It, it continues to this day. Is that, is that correct? It does, yes. And unlike a lot of apparitions, it doesn't seem to be fading. It's always reported as being pitch black, sometimes almost 2D, like a cardboard cutout, except, of course, it's not. And it doesn't seem to be fading to grey or becoming transparent. It's, it still appears to be solid. And, and, you know, when you think about that, though, like a dark figure, a dark mass, and some people report with red eyes, I mean, I have to say, that, that does not sound good. It sounds pretty negative. It sounds evil or nasty or, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's not something that, that you'd like to encounter. It's not. And this is something I always say to people. I get a lot of emails, and David gets a lot of emails from people saying, oh, I want to see it. I'm going to go and visit Swain's Lane. Have you got any advice? And our advice is always, don't. Why would you want to do that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just gonna, wanna... You don't know what's going to happen to you after <laughs> right. doing yeah. what, Why expose yourself to something that negative? I, I just want to chip in whilst we're on the actual subject of the red eyes. Um, and I, I, every time I think of this, I always think of uh, other phenomenon like spring Hill Jack with his red yes. eyes and the Jersey devil with his red eyes. And there, there seems to be this thing with these, um, uh, this ph phantom phenomenon that they have these red eyes. And well, it's with the, uh, um, the, the Mothman too, right? You know, yeah. In, in, uh, the Mothman, yeah. 
in uh, West Virginia, that was also the the figure with the wings and the red eyes. It's it's like whenever you uh, see and the, the owl man of Maui, he had red, red eyes, eyes as well. Red eyes is never good. Yeah. What, what do you and think? And then there's really? the black shark dogs with red eyes. Red eyes, well. yeah, mm-hmm. right. So yeah, I guess anything with red eyes, it's it's just never a good thing. What do you, what do you think, uh, Della? Well, I don't think I'd want to bump into it. <laughs> right. it. It doesn't always seem to have the red eyes. That's that's something that seems to have got picked up. Occasionally, it does. They seem. The impression I get is more that they're more like an amber, like a glinting tiger's eye, than than a red ball of flame. Two red balls of flame. Would it be more in the line of you know, like a cat's eye when light strikes the eye, it kind of gives that kind of glowing effect, something like that, maybe. Something or? like that, except it seems to be glowing from within, mm. and I think this comes down to what we were talking about earlier about how it seems to mesmerise people, and maybe the ocular facility it has with to to stare at people and mesmerize them maybe the, the glowing eyes are part of that now here's here's the thing though and i want to ask you about this even though people have witnessed this figure um standing at the gate or in other locations this ominous uh very dark figure uh, it's not just seeing the figure though there has been communication on some occasions is that correct several yes could you uh, could you elaborate on on some of the the best ones where there has been some kind of communication? Well, the best documented one in recent times would be the two thousand and five Martin Trent sighting, which you can see on well, you can't see it on YouTube. You can see Martin Trent being interviewed about it on YouTube. If you just put Martin Trent Highgate in, you'll you'll come up with a short clip of of that witness describing what happened to him. He was walking down Swain's Lane one. August, I think it was summer anyway, for one summer night. I'll give you this. He had been to the pub, but he wasn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. And he, he lived at the bottom of Swains Lane. So he was walking down and he saw this figure by the main gate. In fact, it wasn't by the top gate on this occasion. He passed it and as he... I should say, he doesn't clarify this in the video, although he has in an earlier interview with me. It was wearing its typical top hat, which it seems to like to adorn. Um... He walked past it and he must have been maybe eight to ten feet away from it because he went right to the other side of the lane to avoid having to get too near to it. This was about midnight and as he passed it, it spoke to him and it said, good evening to you, sir. But the way it spoke was metallic sounding. It, It was sort of gender neutral, a hissing kind of quality to it. And it spoke right in his ear across the lane as if it threw his vo- through its voice. So it, it was as if, um, as, as if somebody had, had come real close to your ear and whispered it into your ear with like a yes. breathy kind of, good evening, sir. Good evening to you, sir. Oh, man. And, and that very archaic lingo yeah, as well, uh, you know, what's going on there. And the, the top hat, that, that's fascinating. So th- has, has there been many cases where, where it looks like this figure is wearing a top hat? Very often, and this is something that cynics come up with all the time, well, sometimes it's wearing a top hat and sometimes it's not, so you're homogenizing all of, or not homogenizing, you're merging all of these accounts to try and say it's one entity. Well, to my mind, we're not talking about somebody that ever was human. I think it's very unlikely. It's a shade of a deceased person. It's something active and something we don't understand. Probably more along the lines of a Mothman type entity. Why on earth wouldn't it appear differently to so different it's people? It's interesting um, that we mentioned the metallic um, voice. A lot of people in uh, UFO cases, and then when. Um, these alleged entities or alien beings or whatever they may be uh, speak, they seem to speak in a metallic voice. Uh, also with the hat, um, we've have a lot of cases where uh, shadow people and shadow men wear the, wear the hats, you know, the, the, the large brimmed hats and stuff. So I think it's a, there's, there, if there is a connection uh, with the dark kind of uh, figure um, and it, and it's speaking with people, it's, it's, it's uh Maybe some sort of, uh, I don't want to use the word, uh, well, I have to, some sort of psychic projection. It's sort of, are we seeing something not, that's not actually there, but we're seeing it through our own mind's eye, which is being put there, placed there by some external, um, some external force? I think there's a lot in that. I think we could refer to it perhaps as a 
potential interdimensional being. Yeah, and something like, interdimensional, yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned about the shadow people, the two classic archetypes of a shadow person. One's wearing a fedora hat or a top hat mm. and a, a cloak or cape. The other is cowled, rather yeah. like a monk, but not a jolly friar tuck type. Um, One other question I have, Della, is has anyone ever witnessed this, this uh, entity actually moving, as in walking or yes. uh, from what A to B, or has it always been static in one place, like? No, it moves about a lot. And when it moves, it moves in a very peculiar fashion, which again makes me think of this interdimensional possibility. It's rather like it's mimicking human behavior, but it never quite gets it right. Mm. When Martin Trent saw it, he he looked back up, so he looked back up Swain's Lane and saw it cross the road. And he does say because of the camber of the road, he couldn't see its feet. They, They were out of shot, as it were, out of sight. But it rather perambulated than walked, like it glided. But when I actually interviewed him about this in person, he said it was almost like it was on a a kind of unicycle. Obviously, it wasn't, but that it didn't move naturally. Like 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 it was on uh, wheels, like it kind of glided across the the the, the road. Roller skates or something, you know, completely yeah. smooth. Like, it doesn't need to move its knees to walk. Well, there you go. Smooth. We've solved it. It's it's a dude in a black cape with a top hat riding a skateboard. <laughs> there you go. I wouldn't want to be at the top of Swain's Lane <laughs> on a skateboard. Right, right. Now, so another another very interesting uh, aspect of... Um, of Highgate Cemetery is, I mean, it's it's an old cemetery. It dates back to to what the the seventeen eighteen thirty nine. Okay, uh, eighteen thirty nine. So that's the nineteenth century, um, and around that time, there was a lot of, I guess, medical experimentation on bodies, and there are tales of body snatching that took place in that area. Can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, Della? Yes, and this actually doesn't concern Highgate Cemetery directly, although it does concern Highgate Village. The Anatomy Act had already been passed by the time Highgate Cemetery was built and and was popular. I don't believe, I'm not aware that Highgate Cemetery was targeted by body snatchers who were digging people up and selling them to the London hospitals, which was happening an awful lot around London. However, the small churchyard, well, it's Chapel of Ease graveyard, technically, uh, which is just opposite the gatehouse in the village, was targeted by body snatchers in the early 1800s, kind of prior to 1831. And also the graveyards around Holloway. Uh, there was a notorious body snatcher. Uh, in fact, he was the guy who he got caught and because he started burking, a phrase relating to burke and hare, meaning killing somebody for their body. Oh. Uh, selling them on. Yeah, that's a bit bit more than just body snatching when you're actually uh, killing somebody for their body. That's So what, what happened with, the, with this guy? Well, the surgeon decided that the body was suspiciously fresh. The body wasn't taken from Highgate, I should qualify. And uh, eventually he got hung, and that led to the passing of the Anatomy Act, meaning that bodies could be obtained legally, and it, it, it ended the trade. Body snatching ceased to be lucrative. However, the, this particular guy who changed medical and legal history in that sense grew up in Highgate, and actually, it's, we don't know for sure, but it's extremely likely that he was operating his body snatching business from West Hill and disguising it as a carting business, People used to pay people to cart goods up and down the hill because it's it's so steep. So yeah, up and down Highgate, um, oh Highgate West Hill, carts full of bodies dug up from the churchyard in the middle of the village and also from the surrounding villages. Wow, it, it, I mean, it it really <laughs> seems that you know the the whole Highgate area is like a hub. For the strange and the unusual. So that's pretty macabre, isn't it? Really? It is. Very, if you think yeah. about it, that you, you have individuals that, that go around looking for freshly buried people so they can dig them up and sell them on to institutions that want to do, you know, anatomy. And they get money for, you know, how fresh, how good quality the body is, uh, if it, you know, if it's a good specimen and it's just a, it, you know, that did go on and that did happen. And, well, and that kind of uh, negative 
kind of vibe, you know, you can see how the area uh, can be impacted by that. There's an echo of this kind of trade in Highgate's history dating back to the um, early 1960s. There was not, not, not a body snatching ring, but a, a, a bones and so on, skull snatching ring operating out of Highgate. And also Kensal Green and surrounding cemeteries. Now, Della, we're, we're we're rapidly approaching the end of our time together, but I, w- I want to just ask you what um, what's going on right now in Highgate, uh, paranormal wise or strangeness wise. Is there anything, any cases you're working on currently, or anything that's that's happening right now? Not working on any active hauntings at the moment, apart from the biggie in Swains Lane, of course. That's always ongoing. Um, I'm trying to track down a lady who took some photographs in Swains Lane of some mist more like ectoplasm floating out through the gates sounds like a bit of a red herring why bother it could be anything but i've got some photographs uh, to hand taken by my friend redmond mcwilliams which are very weird and do appear to show the same thing he couldn't see it at the time but he can see this white mist floating down swains lane out the cemetery and down swains lane it rather appears that it's following him or running ahead of him so i'd be interested in getting some more photographic evidence of that phenomena and tracking down other people that might have seen that. They saw it at the time, the people I'm trying to track down. So if you're listening, please contact me. I'd love to see your photos. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Del. This, this has been amazing. Uh, I, can, I think I can speak for Reeves and myself. We've, we've thoroughly yeah, enjoyed right. talking to you in, in regard to this fascinating topic. So let's let's go over where listeners can find you and your publications. Um, the website is hidden-highgate.org. The link will be in the notes section for this particular episode of Paratalk. And also... Um, uh, Della is working on a book which will be out next year, I believe. Uh, is that correct, Della? Yes, it should be out this time next year. And, and that's going to be called Haunted Highgate, correct? That's Haunted Highgate. But if people want to have their stories included in Haunted Highgate or stories that their relatives or friends might have told them, and I can check them out, then they need to get in touch with me before the well, around about springtime at the latest because it needs to get to the publisher and so on. Well, I, I would advise all listeners to head over to Haunted High, I'm, I'm sorry, HiddenHighgate.org and uh, mm. check out some of the amazing photographs, uh, articles, and blog posts put there by Della. And, and the interactive map. Oh, yeah, the map. The map is awesome. What a great idea. But don't you think, Gareth, when you look at that map, you can see that low line? Ah. <laughs> it's jumping right out. Why is it all in a straight line? Yeah, I know. It's weird, huh? When you see it like that, it's really yeah. clear. Well, Della, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Maybe we can do it again sometime because there is so much to talk about in that uh, that little area of England where you live. Yeah, let's do it again and we can do a cult theory. Oh, yes. That would be great. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, myself and Reeves will be back very, very soon with some more Paratalk. <laughs>